All right, I see that it's shortly after noon, so I want to welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Didi Kuo, I'm the Associate Director for Research at the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law. This is our penultimate seminar for the spring quarter. Thank you for joining us for this entire quarter. We're glad that one of the results of this terrible time is that we have been able to reach a wider audience than we usually would be able to. Next week for our final seminar, two of our Stanford seniors who are part of the honors program at CDDRL will be presenting their award-winning theses. So please be sure to check it out. Um, and if you've missed any of our sessions this spring, they're all available on the CDDRL YouTube website. Um, and you can also join our mailing list to stay updated on events that we'll have over the summer and into the fall. Today, we are very excited to be talking about, even though we're a center on democracy and development, about the autocratic response to COVID-19. And we'll be hearing from Catherine Stoner, who is a deputy director of the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford and a senior fellow at the CDDRL. She has written or edited five books on post-Soviet Russia and on democracy with a new one forthcoming called Russia Resurrected, its power and purpose in a new global order. It's forthcoming this fall, uh, 2020, with Oxford University Press. And we're very excited about it. And we're looking forward to hearing from her today. So without further ado, Catherine. All right, I've unmuted myself. So um, thanks for having me. And um, so I, I've been uh, finishing up different parts of my book project that you just mentioned. Um, but uh, as I've been doing that, I've also been tracking what's going on in Russia um, with coronavirus. So um, to those, I, I gave a talk on uh, just a very small 10 minute uh, talk about two weeks ago with uh, our Europe Center. Um, and so for the, if anyone saw that, there'll be one or two slides here that are familiar, but it's updated and I'm happy, to, happy to, that I have more time so we can talk about more of the implications, uh, political and economic on uh, coronavirus. So this is a picture um, of Vladimir Putin uh, shaking hands with the head doctor of uh, the main hospital in Moscow at the time that was dealing uh, with uh, coronavirus cases. That's in uh, early March. And um, unfortunately, that doctor was diagnosed a few days later with coronavirus. Um, and see that Putin is not wearing a mask, of course, not, um, not wearing any protective uh, gear at that point, but appearing. Um, and um, so that photo gives us some speculation as to why we haven't seen him that much until uh, the last two or three weeks uh, dealing with this um, uh, epidemic. Okay, so let me see, how do I get this to go forward? Here we go, all right. So the first thing I wanted to do was go quickly through and look at, um, whoopsie, um, infection rates in Russia. And so this is just an updated graph as of today, this moment, um, let's see, it's bedtime there. Um, in, uh, in Moscow, um, but here are the uh, cases. So you can see they actually started um, tracking cases at the end of January with the World Health Organization. Um, and um, you can see though that when we, we start the um, non-working period here, the, the shutdown across the country, um, they stay flat and then gradually the numbers go go up, but not a um, huge variation in the number of cases. And when we talk about Russia, we talk about Russia under Putin. Um, there is always suspicion, of course, that um, the numbers have been have been fudged. And so I want to address that. That's one of the big questions. First of all, are numbers, because this isn't a transparent government, uh, are there are the numbers accurate in terms of the numbers of cases and uh, also the numbers of deaths? Uh, in, in, on, uh, in particular caused by coronavirus. Okay, so this uh, was a, a graph uh, that I just put together quickly from our world and data, which if you haven't seen is a really great source. Um, it's just our worldindata.com. And they take uh, uh, data from around the, around the world. Um, and uh, the coronavirus part of the site is really um, great. Um, and so you can put together uh, graphs uh, and charts and maps of uh, pretty much any country in the world uh, and their uh, rate of infection rate, rates of uh, death from Corona. So um, this big pink line here, for some reason the name fell off, but um, I, if we were all together, I would ask you to guess what country that is. And of course it's the United States. 
Um, and these are just daily new confirmed uh, COVID cases um, since uh, the identification of the first um, case. Um, so uh, here we have um, the United States obviously um, leading the world in terms of uh, number of cases, um, Brazil and Russia. Uh, is number three. Now, two weeks ago when I talked about Russia and Corona, it was number two. Um, so this is probably a good uh, thing not to be um, in, the, in the top two of uh, in the number of cases. And India is catching up uh, rapidly. Now, obviously, India has a much bigger population than, than Russia. Russia is a country of, uh, if you count um, Crimea, about 146 million people. Um, uh, so the number of cases is, is high for uh, that country. Um, okay, this is, uh, I have to move this part down here. Um, this is a confirmed uh, COVID-19 death rates. And this is where things start to get kind of interesting uh, when we're talking about Russia. Um, and this is where people are suspicious. And I would, I would like to kind of allay your suspicions, but confirm some of them as well. So is the mort mortality rate artificially low? Well, um, yes and no, um, but it's not necessarily for the sinister reasons you may have in your mind when you think of uh, Vladimir Putin's Russia. Um, so here's Russia, um, which I put in with a uh, big block letter so you can see, um, it is the black line here. And notice that it's merging with India in terms of the numbers of, of deaths. Um, but given that it was, if you'll remember, with the, the number of cases or new cases on a seven-day rolling average up here with Brazil and the United States. So the question is, how come they have so many cases, but not as many people dying um, as, uh, as those countries that have uh, so many cases, uh, the top three. Um, so, you know, one hypothesis is it's Russia, that Putin's cooking the books, he must have uh, two sets of books, the numbers of real deaths, uh, and um, then the numbers uh, that he wants to keep low with fake deaths. Uh, making the, uh, why would he do this? Well, because it makes the uh, Russian health system look great. Maybe it looks, makes the Russian human being look more, uh, you know, uh, solid than those in other countries, especially the United States. Um, okay, so I just don't think this is true, and any serious uh, person who uh, who has studied this doesn't think that this is the full explanation. Um, in that Putin is sitting um, out at his dacha outside of Moscow, where he has spent the epidemic um, after visiting that hospital, um, that he's he's got real numbers, and then they're publishing the fake numbers. Instead, a lot of it has to do uh, with. Um, the way cases are counted in Russia uh, of COVID, uh, mortality, that is, not the actual disease. So, so when we look back at the rate of infection, they're just counting um, infections, right? Um, and so we see um, that, they're, that that's an easy thing. So obviously a very, very high infection rate. Death rate, why not so high? Um, well, uh, they're not counting um, people who have had uh, an underlying condition like cancer who then get COVID on top of it, they're not counting that as a COVID caused death. That's a cancer caused death. So um, the way the Russian health ministry has issued its guidelines, um, and Russia is not the only country that uh, counts this way. This is true in a couple of other parts of, as well, Central Asia and Eastern Europe. Um, is that you only count uh, a case where you can confirm that the direct cause of death was the virus. And so how do you do this? Well, they do it by autopsies uh, primarily. So um, Russia has always uh, confirmed causes of death through autopsy. The autopsy rate in Russia is much higher than it is uh, in let's say Europe or the rest of Europe. Um, and, and so this in part accounts for why the morbidity rate is, um, is so low, relatively speaking. That said though, you know, again, I showed you the number of cases relative to India in terms of the infections. Well, the, the death rate is about the same here too. I, I can't explain India, um, but there they are with the number of cases. Um, 
but the death rate is is not completely dissimilar from Russia. It should probably be a little bit. Russia should be a little higher than India too, but um, it's it's not out of out of line with countries that may count the same way. Okay, if we did count mortality from COVID in Russia the same way as in the United States, for example, um, then estimates are that it would be about uh, a two to three percent death rate rather than um, the 0 0.09 rate, uh, less than one, uh, that, that we're seeing nine now. Okay, so that's one reason. Uh, we'll get to the other, others in just a, in a few minutes. Okay, so what's the geography of cases um, in Russia? Um, well, Moscow overwhelmingly, this is actually just, uh, this should be updated, but Moscow is overwhelmingly the center of uh, the virus and the infections. That's not surprising um, because Moscow is a city after all of about 9 million people. Um, it has a very high population density for Russia. Um, and uh, there are a few regions in Russia that have virtually no um, cases. But as we go farther east, Russia becomes less densely populated. Um, and so this could be one reason. Um, but I think the expectation uh, is that um, infection rates will will increase as uh, time goes on in other parts of Russia. Other couple of hot spots uh, have been uh, Dagestan, um, central uh, down uh, here in the North Caucasus more, more generally. Um, uh, Ramzan Kadyrov, who's the president of uh, Chechnya, um, is in the hospital in Moscow with uh, COVID virus actually showing his uh, wrists to people, or arms to people to show that he's, he's so well healed he doesn't even have IVs anymore. Um, other notables who have had uh, COVID uh, include the current Prime Minister uh, of Russia, Mr. Um, Shustin, um, and um, also um, four members of the cabinet um, have had, have had oh, three members of his cabinet, pardon me, and also Mr. Putin's spokesman, um, Dmitry Peskov, who's the redheaded guy that you may frequently see on TV, uh, speaking on behalf of Mr. Putin. Um, so people very, very close to Mr. Putin have had uh, COVID. Um, the public has been reassured that he was not exposed to Mishustin or um, to Peskov uh, or the other uh, members of the cabinet who have had it um, within two weeks and that he's all clear. But it does sort of raise the question, did, did he have it uh, at any, any one time? Why has he not been a little bit more engaged um, in, uh, in the approach to uh, attacking the infection across Russia? So another thing to note here is um, that there are some variations um, in the cases and also there's tremendous variation in the capacity across Russia to handle these cases. Uh, so um, there, are, uh, there are hospitals in rural Russia that don't have uh, running water. Um, and so how do you maintain proper sanitation um, if you can't actually wash your hands? Um, the other uh, issues, of course, are that um, many don't have uh, the proper equipment or um, masks. And one thing that I'm sure a lot of people who have followed this have noticed in the news is that there is um, reported, uh, reportedly a lot of deaths of uh, medical or healthcare providers, as well as some of them you know, committing suicide effectively because they cannot uh, get hold of the virus. So the estimates there are probably around 300 frontline healthcare providers, most of them um, in um, Moscow uh, and St. Petersburg, other large um, cities um, that, uh, where this has been um, a little bit of an epidemic. Um, I, I guess I wouldn't go get too far, too carried away with that in that uh, healthcare providers have certainly you know, complained in other parts of the world, including here in the United States about, uh, being under-resourced. I'm sure they are under-resourced in Moscow. I, I just don't know if it, they're disproportionately so uh, in comparison to other parts of the world. Um, but that is a, a very sad aspect, uh, obviously, of this epidemic. Um, in terms of the, of the um, uh, epidemic in, across Russia, in Moscow and St. Petersburg, um, hospitals have been um, under a, a national health um, policy and program, hospitals have been refurbished. Um, and so there's actually a, a number of state-of-the-art facilities in um, some of the larger cities. 
Um, but the, the virus caught Russia at a time when it was reforming its healthcare system. The Soviet system had an approach to healthcare that was essentially to uh, not do preventative care. Um, and so uh, constantly the, the system was built for acute care. So if you were sick um, or quite sick, you would get treated in the hospital as opposed to being treated uh, preventatively. Um, so it led to a proliferation of hospitals um, and also proliferation of uh, doctors who were not very well trained, not very well paid. Um, the Soviet system, I think a lot of uh, Russians of a certain age wax uh, philosophical and, and seem to miss it because it did provide, um, you know, what we used to call free bad health care, but it was there was universal health care, um, universal access to health care, a lot of little health clinics, but it wasn't very good. Um, and uh, as I said, didn't provide preventative care. More hospital beds isn't necessarily a, a, a sign of a healthy um, system. And so part of the national health care reform was to um, modernize and decrease um, the size of the system to uh, get rid of some local clinics, some hospitals that didn't function very well or that uh, didn't, you know, their equipment was so old it couldn't be upgraded. Um, and so COVID has hit when that reform is incomplete. Um, so there aren't uh, uh, well-trained or highly trained doctors in some parts of Russia. And so we've seen stories of uh, of a med medical students who have been pulled out of their studies um, to serve uh, COVID cases and, and patients. Um, there is a national compulsory health insurance system. And so if you're, again, in a big population center like Moscow, like St. Petersburg, like Yekaterinburg, like Nizhny Novgorod, um, you can access these centers um, and uh, healthcare is, is uh, decent and, and actually pretty good. Um, 30 years ago, I was treated uh, in a hospital in Russia for pneumonia, and um, let me tell you, it, it wasn't that good, um, but I'm, I'm here. So, uh, But that's not the case now. There are some state-of-the-art facilities. Um, that said, you know, the system hasn't been overwhelmed um, by the epidemic, but it could be uh, overwhelmed by the epidemic. Um, so we're starting to see uh, cases decline. Um, and that has largely been because of uh, some efforts by regional officials. And I'm gonna focus on Moscow and we can talk about some others um, as well. Uh, but uh, in Moscow, the, uh, the mayor of Moscow, um, Sobyanin, has been leading the, uh, the effort against COVID. He's also um, the head of the national task force for COVID as well, notably not Putin, um, but Sobyanin. Uh, he's known to be a very capable sort of techno, uh, a technocrat. And uh, so he regularly updates on his blog and in press conferences, the number of cases he's shown briefing Putin on the number of cases uh, around Russia and, um, and is, has generally I, the face, been the face of COVID and not Putin himself, which, uh, which again, maybe because early on, perhaps he had uh, the virus uh, and we just weren't told. Um, part of his image, of course, is to be a, a strong, healthy mujik, uh, Russian man. And so, you know, getting the virus could have been a sign of weakness or hurt his image, who knows? Um, the other may be, this is not exactly a winning thing for him. Um, and so why not uh, suddenly recognize that Russia is in fact, technically a federation, although he's, uh, come to rule it as a unitary state um, and push down uh, the responsibility for this uh, disease to regional governors. And so this is what's happened. So Moscow, because it's so big, the mayor of Moscow is, is like a, a, a regional governor and he's really a, a, a federal figure. So I, I suppose you could imagine him kind of as the Andrew Cuomo uh, of Russia, but on steroids, uh, much, much more important even than that. Um, so, uh, so Byanin has been actually relatively effective um, in terms of bringing cases down. Um, so in the country, uh, as of May 28th, there are 379,000 confirmed cases, 4,142 deaths. Most of those are in Moscow, uh, most of the cases and most of the deaths. Um, 
this, the um, cases across the country have been steadily declining um, so that they're, I'm trying to hear, so that here, here in the last week or so, um, we're down below 10,000. And so the worry was actually Russia's trajectory, if you look at it, was that it was going this way, uh, up with Brazil. Um, but they're now managing to get below 10,000. And every day in the last five days or so, it's been below 9,000. Um, the last two days below 8,500. So the trend is good. The direction is down. Um, deaths per day, though, seem to be increasing. Now, the Ministry of Health has said we should expect um, this. It's partially a function also um, of testing. Um, but I think that's also good evidence for, you know, why why report cases truthfully and deaths not truthfully? It just doesn't really make sense. And so it's the way they're counting. And now uh, uh, um, they're beginning just to, to change that system. Um, so um, uh, a lot of the progress has been in Moscow. It had to be in Moscow. Um, and I'll, talk, uh, I'll tell you in a moment about the, the why the progress has been made uh, in Moscow, but there's a, been a very, very strong um, local response to, uh, to uh, self-isolation and lockdown and some actually uh, cool use of technology um, where people have to be scanned if they're more than 100 meters from their apartment. I guess it's not cool. It's kind of an oppressive use of, of technology that probably wouldn't pass in the United States, but uh, in an autocracy, it's, uh, it, it seems to work. Um, so uh, what you do is you scan your work pass and uh, uh, from your phone, you have to download it, you scan it. And if uh, you are outside more, this is just within Moscow with uh, 100 meters or so of your building. Some people have to walk their dogs or whatnot. Um, then you can be asked to show whether or not you have a pass. Um, the uh, certain um, kinds of workers, like healthcare workers, for example, um, their pass, when it's scanned, will show their name and um, uh, what they're allowed to do, how far they're allowed to go. Um, so that's uh, the, the lockdown otherwise for nine weeks has been very, very tight. Um, they started stage one opening up, which Putin announced uh, for Russia about two weeks ago. In Moscow, they started, They um, just this morning, the mayor announced that they'd be entering stage two. So starting to open up um, a few more uh, retail businesses. Um, and uh, the rules are basically for uh, people who are not working in retail, not working for large corporations um, that have been opened or uh, cannot be outside. Um, and, uh, uh, there is an experimental go to the park um, program where that will allow people uh, on shifts as they did in parts of Europe as well um, by neighborhood when you can be out and people over 65 who'd been first asked not to stay home then required to stay home will also as of June 1st be allowed um, to stroll around outside. So here's Russia just presenting the cases um, again relatively uh, relative to the U.S. to Brazil. Two weeks ago when I showed you this, um, uh, Russia was in second place. Um, but here is unfortunately Brazil, another brick, um, is, has joined, um, uh, is, is heading up uh, in, in terms of its cases. One thing to note though is uh, when you, know, you often hear on the radio, Russia has the third highest cases in the, in the world. Yes, but look how distant number two and number three are from the United States. Um, that's partly a function of, of population, but even here, when we look at per 100,000, so we're, we're, we're controlling for population variation, um, the U.S. is, is, is double. Uh, it's much higher um, than, uh, than Russia and certainly than, than Brazil, so, uh, and uh, lower than the U.K., Spain, Italy. So I think this gives you some perspective in terms of where uh, Russia is. Um, it, that's not great. Uh, they certainly don't want to be there, but that's where they are. This is the interesting part. And as I mentioned, it's partly um, because of the way they count. If you look at Turkey and India, um, the counting may be the same there. Um, uh, you, you wonder why Turkey's that much um, lower in terms of mortality. Okay. So another reason why I said health ministry uh, instruction is to only count those dead from COVID 
Another is Russia's population pyramid and demography. So if the disease tends to hit more people over um, 50, 60, 70, there aren't that many people um, over age 70 in Russia. Their population pyramid uh, gets very, it's more like a bulge. I'm sorry, I meant to have a slide and I can grab it in a second when I finish talking. Um, but um, essentially that, that is, a, is a relatively small portion of the pyramid, but that's a function unfortunately of Russian life expectancy, um, which is uh, for men and women in the low 70s, 72, 73 years old. Um, so they're not losing a lot of people from COVID in their, in their late 70s or 80s because they just don't have that many people uh, in their late 70s or 80s um, getting it. Um, this would especially be true with men. Um, their life expectancy is about um, uh, 65, 66 years old uh, right now. Um, so that's another thing to bear in mind when we look at the mortality numbers. The third sort of favorite is the political pressure um, and that is definitely there. Um, there was, uh, I think yesterday, the day before, um, a report of a regional official being caught uh, on audio um, fudging the numbers with, uh, with other members of his administration. There's also political pressure, and this, I think, again, is um, a function of Russia being um, an autocracy. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a point, uh, Judy, I heard Judy Twig uh, make a few days ago on a podcast that, um, of course, regional health workers um, are under some pressure to keep the numbers low in the way, in the same way that regional political officials are required to get out the vote um, for United Russia and for President Putin during elections. Regional health workers are looking for direction uh, on on what it is that the boss wants. Um, and probably better to keep numbers low and show what a great job we're doing um, than, um, than you know, let them float up too high, keep it realistic. It's hard to know in combination the three uh, of these possibilities um, that, uh, that are, are keeping the numbers where they are, but I think it's largely reporting and, and demography, but there's certainly political pressure. Um, there's also, though, been uh, a lot of um, publicity over how badly things have been uh, going in some regions and in some hospitals. And uh, so social media has lit up with that. There have been doctors uh, who, uh, there are doctors who keep a Facebook page reporting the number of other healthcare workers that have died um, because they didn't have enough um, PPE. Um, so um, while there may be political pressure on, uh, to some degree, to keep the numbers low, uh, people also uh, have felt somewhat free. Uh, there are consequences um, to, uh, to report bad handling uh, of the disease. Okay, so just a quick few words on state response as I run out of uh, time here. Um, so just bear in mind, Russia is a huge federal country, as I said, uh, has uh, 11 time zones, 11 time zones. It's um, 85 subnational units, uh, technically federal, um, but Putin pretty much eradicated um, federalism and turned it into more a unitary state in practice, but its true name is the Russian Federation. Um, so this uh, has seemed like a good um, problem to devolve suddenly to the regions, but it is to, uh, to, you know, to be uh, honest or to be balanced. Uh, it is a local problem uh, in, some, in some ways as well, although certainly the federal government um, can provide funding. Um, as I mentioned, Mayor Sabyanin is the head of the federal task force. He's kind of taken on the role of, uh, of the face of COVID. Um, regional governors are tasked with managing um, their own uh, regions, um, but they have been given unfunded federal mandates to, for example, keep people's pay going to the end of the year. Um, and other relatively generous uh, social benefits without the federal government actually giving the, the um, funding to support some of those. Um, as I mentioned, Putin had not, at least uh, for the first month, month and a half or so, been appearing day to day uh, in terms of managing the virus. And this strikes some of us as a little bit peculiar because uh, usually he appears regularly on television and he fixes everything. Um, he was putting out fires um, about eight years ago from a bush plane personally uh, on TV. Um, and so suddenly not, not appearing here. 
Um, but he's just started to look a little bit more in charge, re-emerging from, uh, from his den uh, outside Moscow, coming into the Kremlin for, um, for celebrations of uh, the end of World War II and for Victory Day, or for the Victory Day, not World War II. They've had to reschedule the celebration for World War II, but apparently it'll now be June 24th. Um, they've, they, at the federal level, there's been financial relief, um, particularly for state and public sector um, workers, but that's a lot of people uh, in Russia. That's over 50% of the economy. Um, and um, Russia came into this, um, this crisis with a, a war chest um, that they could spend, the federal government could spend and could distribute um, from um, their uh, social uh, insurance and social security funds, um, about $500 billion. Um, so they have a, um, come up with a six month tax referral for small and medium businesses, but no real money into uh, small and medium businesses in terms of providing them um, with cash in hand to pay things like rent and whatnot. Um, families uh, with young children get a direct um, subsidy. Uh, unemployed get a guaranteed minimum wage to the end of um, 2020. Um, banks offer repayment vacations on loans and mortgages who, to those whose incomes are down. Um, and interest in dividends and companies is gonna be taxed at a higher late, rate to try and keep money in uh, inside Russia. Um, okay, whoops, this is the serious response. This is um, Putin in a hazmat suit later in the day. Uh, he's shaken hands with the doctor who's behind him in his own hazmat suit, which I showed you earlier. Um, but, uh, but here he is um, going into the actual COVID ward. Uh, little did he know the guy behind him had already contracted COVID. Um, so what are the socioeconomic effects? Um, well, almost half the population have said there's been no change to their daily lives, 21% uh, uh, able to work from home, 15% um, are, went on unpaid leave or wage reduction, only 1% so far fired. This is still a terror, being unemployed in uh, Russia, a bit of a hangover from the Soviet period perhaps. Um, people are terrified of this. 70% um, uh, of Russian families, um, probably not terribly dissimilar from the US have no more than six weeks of savings. It's a very low uh, saving society. Um, so, uh, you know, they can't afford not to be paid. Um, and this is, uh, this is why Putin has made these promises, but he must pony up the money and that's going to be the issue. Um, 735,000 registered as unemployed. Um, it could get up to, to 10%. It's probably around 7%, but we don't quite know yet. And we don't know how much is permanent, of course. Real wages had been on the decline. And this is where we start to get into some of the political problems and longer term effects that could come out of this crisis for Putin's regime in particular. Um, last summer um, was, was a summer of protest in uh, Russia. And um, and you know, one of the things that people complain about, although they weren't overtly protesting this in most cases, is that um, real wages uh, are going down. Um, and so they will go down even further uh, from, from COVID as the economy struggles to continue. Um, small and medium sized businesses, which are usually the engine of most economies have been hit biggest. Um, and uh, there's clear worry that those will just not recover. Um, the big state sector uh, is being heavily subsidized. And in 2008 in, uh, and nine in the economic crisis um, that swept over Russia then, that, those were exactly the companies um, and the sector that was uh, best defended by the federal government. So uh, uh, we, we're starting to see that already and we can, uh, we can uh, expect that that would continue and, and that's where a lot of the support will go. Moscow, as I mentioned, is entering stage two as of June 1st. Okay, so political and economic effects, and I think this is almost where I will end. Um, when COVID hit, uh, Russia was about to have a referendum on constitutional changes. Um, and um, they, it was quickly passed through the parliaments. So the time, from the time Mr. Putin announced it in January till um, the, the lockdown uh, in um, the first week or so of March, um, the uh, constitutional changes had been drafted, had gone through committee, had gone through both the lower and upper houses of parliament and a re referendum 
um, had been scheduled um, for a few weeks later. Um, one of the first things they had to do was to postpone the referendum. They postponed it once, had a date in May, and now have postponed it again. It will probably take place uh, on June 24th, which would be the same day they've rescheduled the Victory Day um, celebrations for. So that's a bit confusing, but we don't know for sure that they'll vote uh, June 24th. Intriguingly enough, um, a vote by mail uh, law uh, has passed its first reading and I may even by now have passed its second um, so that um, the election could or the referendum could take place to pass these constitutional changes um, by mail. Um, why is Putin anxious to do this? Uh, well, um, because his approval ratings are dropping. As I mentioned, real wages have been dropping before. His, his approval rating for um, the first time since uh, about 2011 is down to 59%. Um, and so uh, this could explain why he waited to uh, be look, to appear that he was in charge of the COVID response. As I said earlier, it's not necessarily a winner um, for him. Um, and uh, he um, has, has stepped in at times that are opportune for him to, to try and things that, that he knows are a winner, like uh, gradually reopening the country. Um, the, the, as I mentioned there, the biggest fear is um, social protest, uh, so, social instability. Um, and um, Mr. Putin views his job, uh, and he even said this in, uh, in introducing to Parliament some of his constitutional changes in, in uh, proposed changes then in March 2020, um, are uh, to uh, ensure the stability uh, social stability of the country. Well, this is incredibly destabilizing. Um, and the summer, last summer of 2019 had been a summer of protests, often focused on, on small issues, on local issues, not necessarily um, big, you know, uh, anti-federal government issues, but it's social instability. And he needs to maintain that social control and to solve the succession uh, issue. Um, and so the way he has solved that and answered the question is uh, there won't really be a succession. Uh, he'll stay in office until 2036 um, if this referendum goes through. So the referendum is a real priority and sooner rather than later as his approval rating and the approval rating of the federal government goes down um, further through the, the COVID virus. So I'm sure that's the number one concern. Um, is all of this is going to affect uh, negatively um, uh, the referendum and he needs to make sure it's passed and it looks right. Um, his regime's stability and success depend on it. Okay, so I will stop there. There's lots I didn't answer or talk about Didi, but I, uh, I definitely could. Um, and um, uh, there's a lot more to say. It's a, it's a fascinating problem for, for Russia, but a terrible one as well. Thank you so much uh, for that talk. That was great. We have a few questions coming in. So um, what someone is asking, have you looked at excess mortality rates or do you have a sense of, um, since that has also been used as a metric that might capture the true or at least approximate the, the true costs of COVID-19, do you know how excess mortality compares now to the same period a year ago, for example, in Russia? So there have been um, some great journalists from um, from Moscow Times actually who have been following this and investigating it, and they're estimating that it it could be as high as twenty percent, oh. um, the excess mortality. But they, but they're um, they're guessing that it's uh, that they don't know for sure. But um, they've gone back and tried to compare ten years. Um, okay. Ten springs um, to get that number, but um, that's the guess. Okay, um, Alberto Diaz Cayeros is noting that there are lots of parallels with Mexico, which was already starting a federal overhaul of its decentralized healthcare system this year as well. And his question is more about suicide of these healthcare workers, which is so sad. He the, so there are deaths of despair in the United States, as you know, research from Deaton and Case. Um, that presumably also need to be counted in an eventual full accounting as part of the excess mortality related to COVID-19. So is there a sense of how these deaths are being entered into the civil registry of mortality or on death certificates? And do you think there will ever be a reliable way of getting data on these kind of deaths of despair? And in addition to the problem you already noted of having the underlying causes be the sort of reason for death on all of these death certificates? 
Oh, you're muted, Catherine. I'm trying to get to my end. There we go. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, the, the, the short answer is um, Mexico is a lot more open than Russia, right? And so I, 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 I would hazard, and here I have to hazard a guess, we can't get as good data um, from Russia as, as you can get from Mexico. And, and so um, given the political environment and that the, the, this is a hardening autocracy, um, deaths of despair that could be linked to COVID and that, that we could reasonably link to COVID, I don't think will be officially linked to COVID. Um, but people's families link them to COVID, right? So there still is a political implication here if you know if your family member has died and this epidemic was a healthcare worker didn't have proper ppe um, and killed themselves because they were overwhelmed then you know if there are enough of those then that could presumably have some some kind of political effect but um yeah okay um so carl eikenberry is asking if the mayor of moscow risks uh incurring putin's wrath perhaps by outshining him it's been noted that there are other authoritarian leaders for example or sort of authoritarian aspirers like bolsonaro who have sidelined their medical experts and we certainly know our president here has a questionable relationship with science at best so um what is the sort of tricky balance putin has here of being outshone by some people who are in front of the COVID crisis politically Okay, so first, hey, Carl, great to hear from you. Um, so Sabyanin is a very loyal technocrat, um, and uh, he is not uh, Putin. Putin has such firm, I think, control now uh, on the system. Mm. Uh, and, you know, Sabyanin is there in Moscow because Putin, you know, made sure he won that uh, election. So his, uh, his, I think legitimacy resides with uh, Putin. He can be seen to be doing this, but he's very tightly linked to, to Putin. So I think there's very little um, little chance of that. Okay, um, Steve Piper is asking, Russia's fiscal stimulus amounts to less than 3% of GDP, which is mm -hmm. much less than what the Western industrialized countries are putting in about 10% and more. Putin has a $165 billion national wealth fund. So yeah. at what, why is he- and, and more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. I, I, 500 billion rubles. Um, right. So that's a big puzzle. Um, why isn't he dipping into it more? Um, and one answer possibly, Steve, is uh, that um, he, oil prices, when they started, when COVID hit, Russia and Saudi Arabia were in a bit of a tussle uh, over um, global oil supply, uh, supply and uh, they were playing chicken with oil prices, and you might remember, of course, about a month ago, um, oil futures were even, you know, future sales, that is, uh, in, in negative territory. Um, that is, you'd have to pay someone to, to buy your oil, basically, or take it away. Right. Um, so Russia, to balance its budget, needs an oil, uh, a, a per barrel price of about $45 US. So I think oil is around $30, $35 right now. So um, that means it's not you know, it's not getting that money in um, and also, you know, there's demand has declined. So it could be that they're waiting um, and to see how low and how badly things go before opening, uh, opening their wallets uh, or, or the federal wallet to start distributing uh, a little bit more money and, and look to see who's been hit the hardest. Um, but I think we can, we'll, we'll end up seeing it come out faster. People, uh, doctors have certainly complained, you know, Putin makes promises um, and then uh, the policy isn't implemented. Uh, so uh, why is this? He, so a big promise and big complaint uh, that we see in the media is he promised uh, bonuses for frontline um, healthcare workers and you know, most of them didn't receive the money until very recently. And, and um, there's always suspicion, of course, that local officials have, have made off with it. Um, and so it could be that waiting until they they're sure they can then get money uh, in, in place. Um, but uh, yeah, it's going it's it will have to go up or they will have people on the streets. Okay. Um, how, let's see, 
I have a question, I suppose, about the constitutional reforms you had mentioned. And we had a point of clarification from a listener who just wants to know, would these constitutional reforms keep Putin in power till 2026 or 2036, as your slide indicated? And my question is also 36. 36, because his current, here's the constitution here, uh, with changes, um, but I always keep it right by my side. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, so his, he, he uh, came back to power and was uh, re-elected president in 2012. That term goes to 2018. He was okay. re-elected again. That term goes to 2024. And the constitutional changes open the door for him because it's a new constitution. He can come back for a third two terms, a third set of two oh, okay. terms. He can go 2024 plus six is 2030 plus six is 2036. Okay, so my question was, you know, given the challenges even democratic governments have right now about how to hold elections, how to make them free and fair under these kinds of circumstances, how, and, and given that Putin has declined in popularity and there have been protests, how do you think this might affect the project of autocratization mm -hmm. in Russia? I know that's perhaps unpredictable, but do you mm -hmm. see any threats emerging from inside the government? You say that the mayor of Moscow is really loyal, but Mike McFaul is also asking if there are any potential divides that um, could become serious. So, um, so, you know, his population, his approval is, um, or trust level is what it is, is has declined slightly. It's 59% still. Yeah. Um, I think it, that, uh, you know, for, for him, that's not acceptable um, because the legitimacy of the system depends and has, this has happened over time. It didn't start out this way. D depends now on this myth of Putin, right? Um, yeah. that, that he is omnipresent, omnicapable. Um, so he's very sensitive to it. The administration is very sensitive to it. So um, this is a this is a fragility, right? So ultimately, this is you know it, it looks like a very stable autocracy. He's very anxious to um, to make make it stable by making sure that he stays in office and at the center of this system. So um, will the you know what what will happen potentially? Well. Um, I think what he fears, and we had some interesting uh, seminars this year um, that looked at Putin and society. And so I think that, I think something that is, uh, you know, what he fears is instability. Yeah. And so this is the risk. Uh, so, uh, you know, what could happen? Well, the fear I don't think is from anyone within the government. Uh, he has, you know, a, a prime minister who again is a, a technocrat, right? Um, he has, you know, you could, you could, hardly find anyone less charismatic if you searched uh, the uh, 146 million people of Russia than, than the current prime minister. Um, so there isn't, you know, he's tried passing his personal uh, charisma and legitimacy to someone else. It was Medvedev. It didn't work, right? So Medvedev's not a possibility. There's no one within the government um, because he's now put in, in most of the ministries in this most recent government um, after 2018, um, uh, people who have a lot of sort of technical expertise, right? So the, the project was really, um, uh, you know, shoring up some of the weaknesses in the economy uh, within reason. Um, but um, so there's no one within government per se. Unfortunately, just because his approval is declining uh, and trust in him is declining, you know, again, don't overestimate those numbers, right? Uh, Two years ago, it was over 80%. Now it's 60%. I'm sure he cares. And that is significant, of course, and problematic. It doesn't mean, though, that that, su that support is going to an opposition like Alexei Navalny, right? So you can't, you can't assume that. Here you can, you can assume that, oh, it's going from Republican to Democrat, perhaps. There you can't assume that. And, and you know, that's, uh, that is uh, what pollsters like uh, uh, at Lovada Center would tell you, right? Is that we don't see a commensurate increase in some opposition figure. Um, so you would instead get these kind of loose, spontaneous protests often on, on local issues. And that's what has, has happened. And unfortunately, this autocracy has become very effective at sidelining um, the opposition. So we know who Alexei Navalny is. We like Alexei Navalny. But you know, Russians out in Vladivostok 
don't necessarily know Alexei Navalny or, or think anything about him, right? Right. Um, so we have to make sure that we don't see it, you know, loss for Putin, gain for someone else. It's, it's not clear that that's the case. That was actually a question we had from one of our undergraduates, Tiffany Zhu, who was asking if the opposition has at all um, sort of organized any kind of response to Putin, whether systematically or not. During no, the so, uh, well, hi, Tiffany, she was my RA. <laughs> um, um, so no, not really, um, because they're not allowed out, right? Um, there was going to be a protest against um, the uh, proposed constitutional reforms in uh, March, uh, but they went into lockdown. Um, so uh, okay. you can't go out on the streets uh, um, to do that. There, there's some online, but I, 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 you know, I wouldn't overestimate the efficacy of that. Most people get their news from television uh, still in Russia. So that's another set of questions sort of about state media in Russia. First, Frank Fukuyama is asking, how have they covered the US response to COVID and Trump? Um, in particular, how are they handling this relationship um, and what has coverage of us been? And Nancy O'Kale, one of our visiting scholars, is asking if Putin is using state media um, effectively to reflect his successes. And do you think he'll be able to use state media to combat some of the bad numbers about economic decline or unemployment, um, given that you just said that's how he still reaches a wide audience? Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of coverage of the U.S., that most of the news, um, well, not most of the news, but a lot of news is, is, um, is COVID, of course, right, within Russia. Um, and in terms of um, the U.S., it's been more, um, yes, there's, you know, it, it's more sort of the failures of uh, the United States in terms of which is true, right? They don't have to really embellish um, much. Uh, it, things have not gone well um, here. Um, there's also, of course, been uh, in the news, um, they're selling at cost, which Mr. Trump said was very nice, um, ventilators. Uh, Russia, of course, sent ventilators over and there was a, um, uh, you know, even the pilot who, uh, uh, the air traffic control, pardon me, was thanked. Um, uh, thanked the pilot for bringing in this important material. And at first it was reported and was reported in Russia as uh, being donated to the United States, which obviously played extremely well. Uh, but it turned out actually it was sold at cost uh, or below cost. Um, so now the US has sent back some um, ventilators, sent their own ventilators to help, uh, to help Russia. Um, but the, the big news was that Russia was also helping the United States, also helped Italy, by the way. There was a big airlift to um, Italy of, um, of PPE um, and ventilators. Uh, so the complaints have been uh, that these were very low quality and mostly you know, junk uh, in, in the Italian case, but um, that was not what appeared in, in the Russian news. And this isn't, isn't for Italian consumption or American consumption. This is for the consumption of, of the Russian domestic uh, audience, of course. Right. Yeah. So I think using state media, using television pretty um, effectively. Um, but people also know that, you know, it, the other thing is, um, is, is keeping sort of uh, nostalgic movies on and things like that available. But this is in China in terms of, of a lockdown of information. They've acknowledged that the epidemic's bad. People know, you know that they have to stay inside. There are serious um, repercussions if you violate the lockdown. For example, in Moscow, um, you can, if you're caught outside when you shouldn't be um, and a long way from your house, you uh, can be forced to do 100 hours of community service. I mean, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, there's some legitimacy here. So using, you know, they're using enforcement, you know, mechanisms of an autocracy pretty effectively there. Um, so a few weeks ago, we had uh, our colleague Sherry Berman come talk about regime types and the regime response between democracies and authoritarian mm -hmm. countries to COVID. And she was noting that it's ne not necessarily a nice breakdown along regime lines, but instead is really about governance and the types of institutions you have in place. And I remember in your book, you've written about the public health response to tobacco use in mm -hmm. Russia and how it's been a pretty effective public health campaign. 
So I was just wondering if there's a sort of robust public health infrastructure or not in Russia that has been um, that has played a prominent role here, whether at the national or the local level that can piggyback off some of the structures that were in place prior. Yeah, good question. Yeah, so I, I, I know Sherry well. She was my roommate in, uh, at, you know, as you know, at Harvard. Um, but anyway, um, um, so yes, I would agree that it's not an autocracy, uh, democracy thing. Um, it is a governance capacity thing. Um, I think Russia fumbled at the beginning um, because they, you know, Putin was very proud of the fact that he closed down the border with China and um, they seemed to be doing well uh, early on, but then it got really bad. And it, it um, th but there are pockets of Russian, uh, uh, various parts of, of Russian governance that are actually quite effective. So, you know, nobody, well, very few people expected that the tobacco reform uh, would be implemented uh, so effectively. And, uh, you know, parts of it have been in implemented incredibly effectively. Uh, whether or not that means smoking rates go down is an open question, but where people can smoke has, has changed uh, and, and, and for the better. Um, I, I do think with the COVID response, because it's been so local, it's hard to generalize. And you know, the question Steve Pfeiffer asked, uh, you know, what's the federal government's main role going to be? Distributing money. Uh, we haven't seen that yet, right? And how, how well they do. Um, with that and how quickly they get it out and to whom. Um, so that's an open question. Um, I think in terms of uh, lockdowns being pretty effective, they, they've done that well. So the repressive capacity of the state, pretty good. Um, and they can deal out those fines um, pretty well as they did with smoking. So you know, there's a, there is a real threat uh, of a consequence. Um, right. When that's available, I don't think it has anything to do necessarily with a public health system that is administration and implementation of, of policy. And in those cases, that's uh, not done by public health. It's done by um, you know, state and local governments and the federal government sometimes, but yeah. Okay, so we only have time for one more question and it comes from Alice Underwood, who was yeah. running um, the Russia Power um, Project at, at Stanford. So hello to, to Catherine, how do Russians generally feel about the lockdown? Are they angry about the strict measures or do they, um, have they in, instead been grateful perhaps, especially uh, given the technology and surveillance mechanisms, you know, what kind of social response is this having? And do you think that the trust ratings for Putin are more a function of COVID or more a function of economic uh, impacts? Right, so, um... There's very low trust in the public health system. Um, that's like 13%. <laughs> but there's um, more, you know, so his, his trust levels had been declining before this. Okay. Um, so how seriously this will impact, it's not clear. They started to go up over a few weeks, uh, the first few weeks, and now seem to be, you know, plateauing again around 59, 60%. So we haven't seen what yet. Um, I think it's, it's what's done in the recovery that, that's going to be um, problematic. Um, what was the second part of the question? Sorry, I'm forgetting. It was how do Russians feel about the lockdown? Oh, oh so um, I think that varies somewhat as well, but in the big cities in Moscow, um, they're accepting it. Uh, there, is a, there is a certain percentage of people though, and I'm forgetting off the top of my head what it is, I'd have to look back in my notes, who, who think it's all a big scam. But it's uh, relatively, you know, we have those people here too, of course. Um, it's relatively though, I think it's about 20%. Um, that is, it's not 80%. Um, uh, so, um, but, uh, people seem not to be violating it for the most part, um, at this point, um, at least um, my focus has mostly been on Moscow. And I think that's where, you know, the implementation of lockdown policy has been pretty darn good. Um, they're now allowed to, uh, you know, stroll around parks and whatnot, or will be in the, in the next couple of days. Um, and, um, there's also been a lot of testing. So people have been relatively compliant. Um, the streets of Moscow are certainly empty. All right. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Catherine, for this really wonderful talk. I really, we all appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who tuned in today. We hope that you're all staying safe and we will hopefully see everyone soon. Thank you, Great. Catherine. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.